Hi, I'm Ben Albritton from the Stanford University Library, and this is my colleague Rob Sanderson from Los Alamos uh, National Lab. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, something we're calling shared canvas, uh, a way of dealing with uh, interacting with digitized medieval manuscripts in a networked and distributed way. And the way we're going to deal with this is a two-person demonstration is that I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivation, that is, what our project is and why we're doing it. Uh, Rob's going to talk a little bit about the shared canvas model that underlies what we're doing. Uh, we're going to give you a couple of examples, and then Rob's going to give a rousing defense of the distributed approach that we've taken. Uh, so to get started with motivation, Rob and I are two nodes in a very large collaborative effort uh, that has been very generously funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and includes the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, the British Library, Oxford and Cambridge Libraries, uh, the Swiss eCodices Project, uh, Johns Hopkins University, the University of Toronto, and uh, most recently the Walters Art Museum. Uh, as that list might suggest, uh, that's a lot of repositories. And over the last 15 or 20 years, uh, we've all digitized our medieval content at varying rates uh, with varying platforms for delivery. And that leads to a big problem for us as a group of repositories wanting to share and interoperate our content, uh, which is that we built a whole bunch of silos, sometimes reinventing the wheel over and over again, uh, which is a detriment to us as a group of repositories, but also to our user base, the scholars who are interested in medieval manuscripts. Uh, we've built uh, multiple websites, of course. Uh, Page-turning apps have been reinvented with just about every project that's come up. And uh, various methods for discovery and delivery have also been uh, reused, uh, as well as descriptive formats for the content itself and uh, a number of models for how people might interact with that material. Some sites have included additional tools. Uh, some sites have provided bare bones access to single images for each page of a manuscript. And the feedback that we started to get was that that was not what our reading audience wanted. Um, so a little bit of a digression about what the scholars have asked for. Uh, in the current system that we have of a bunch of silos, a scholar will visit our site, work with some manuscripts within our site, and then leave, and then perhaps visit another site and deal with material in, uh, in their site in whatever formats it's available. In fact, what the scholars want to do and what they do in the real world is amass collections of data from multiple repositories and then work with them in a unified way. Uh, Manuscripts also have been presenting us with a, a couple of other uh, problematic issues in terms of sharing material with scholars and with each other, uh, which is that not only are medieval manuscripts often held in multiple locations, bits of the same manuscript are often held in, this, in multiple locations. Uh, some only exist in fragments. Some existed up until the World Wars uh, in the last century and no longer exist, so we might have some photographic record of them, uh, but they're gone physically. And some may be only partially digitized uh, as a result of digitization campaigns that focused primarily on pretty pages rather than semantic content bearing pages. So the vision that we are after is a rich landscape of interconnected repositories of images, texts, and media that scholars can work with through third-party tools and then contribute more information back to. Uh, Bill McCoy mentioned yesterday that digitization of existing books is the past or backward-looking and born digital content is forward-looking. What we're trying to do is give scholars a place where they can work on these old digitized books and create new born digital content uh, that goes alongside of it. Uh, we would like to provide seamless user interfaces uh, disconnected from those of repositories themselves. So let the experts build the interfaces that best suit the community's needs. And we'd like to improve efficiency across the repositories and tool developers uh, by providing a, a shared development uh, network. 
The requirements for this are twofold, uh, a shared data model, which Rob will talk about in just a moment, and then a shared API uh, that we can all um, use from our various repositories so that developers can build against them. And this will kind of take us into some more specific use cases now. Uh, when we first got started, uh, one of the main needs that we recognized was the need for transcription for scholars. Uh, medieval manuscripts are notoriously resistant to OCR. This may change at some point, but at the moment it requires human intervention. And so we started off by deciding, well, why not just transcribe directly from the facsimile images we have? We're now calling this the naive approach. And the reason why is because some of these pages, in fact, many of these pages, exist in multiple states. Uh, so for instance, as you'll note on this image, uh, there is a fold-out flap that we've transcribed as la terre de Cécile. Uh, it's uh, on a flap that folds behind the actual page of the book. So if we see the version of the image that has that folded down, do we lose that annotation? Once it folds up, we've got it. If the second flap on that page folds out, we've got it. But what happens if we see the back of that page then, where that same bit of uh, semantic content is there, folded upside down? Well, that led us to the conclusion that you can't simply transcribe from the image, but you need to transcribe the idea or attach your transcription to the idea of the thing that underlies that image, the physical object. Similarly, in dealing with uh, annotations, uh, we approached this initially thinking scholars want to attach their particular annotations to a page. And that, uh, that approach quickly um, telescoped out when it became apparent to us that not only do scholars want to add their own annotations, but the annotations of previous users of a particular book become cultural, culturally important in their own right. Uh, so this manicule on the left-hand side, the finger pointing at a bit of highlighted text, uh, it might be something that a scholar would wish to talk about. So annotations about annotations about annotations, and so on. Furthermore, as I mentioned, uh, missing pages from manuscripts that could have disappeared any time in the last thousand years, what do we do with them? In many cases, we know what might be on them, uh, but we have no way of talking about them if the images or the facsimiles don't exist. Similarly, if things exist only in a fragmentary state, uh, we need a model that can handle uh, both the fragment itself and what might be missing from the page from which it came. So with that, I will turn over to Rob to talk about how he's solved this problem. Thank you for the use of the word solved. <laughs> okay, uh, so the approach that we're taking um, is a canvas-based paradigm. Uh, everyone is familiar with canvases. They're an empty space in which you um, associate resources with in order to build up a display. And and of course it doesn't work because uh, it's configured not to. So I just hit escape to show you that PowerPoint has a blank canvas. That's right. <laughs> Which you then associate images with and text. So that we're using exactly the same, the same principle. So a shared canvas then um, is a blank space which represents the physical object. You can then associate things with it. Um, Okay, how are we going to associate things with a blank space in a distributed way such that multiple people can uh, associate their resources uh, with the same canvas? Uh, for example, uh, the Walters Art Museum have a wealth of experience in digitizing medieval manuscripts and interacting with them. Uh, they have the Archimedes palimpsest um, there that they have uh, 20, 30 images in different lighting conditions of every single page uh, of the manuscript. But they don't necessarily read Greek. They certainly don't read all of the languages um, from antiquity. But there are many scholars that are extremely interested in doing that. So what we want to be able to do is allow those scholars to associate their texts with the Walters images or anyone else's images. So we thought, well, scholars are used to annotating their resources, you know, annotating text onto other text, annotating text onto images. So why can't we just use those annotations that they're already familiar with um, in order to build up the display uh, of, uh, of the page? 
So we ha now have a, an annotation where the comment, if you will, is the image. And the thing that the image is somehow about, um, referencing the discussion yesterday about open annotation, is this blank space um, that represents the page. We can then do the same for text um, to associate the text of the page with the part of the canvas that represents the part of the page where that text appears. Um, in computer science, the way to solve everything is within direction. Um, essentially, that's what we're doing. So we use uh, the open annotation collaboration data model um, to do this, which I talked about at a high level yesterday. Um, the great thing about talking about the same project twice is that I now get to respond to some of the tweets. Um, so OAC has a top-down uh, model uh, where we analyzed all of the use cases that we could possibly come up with um, and built the simplest model possible that would accommodate 95% of them. Now we're doing a bottom-up approach in order to validate that. So we think that we have the best of, of both worlds there. So for, by annotation then, we mean both uh, scholarly commentary about manuscripts as well as painting the resources onto the blank shared canvases in order to build up the facsimiles of those resources. Here are the, the skittles um, that I promised you. Uh, the yellow node is an annotation, it's the document. The blue node is the body or comment of the annotation. And the red node is the target, the resource that the body is about. This is the simplest um, open annotation model. The most complex one isn't significantly harder. It only has uh, information about locations within resources, so part of um, the target or part of the body. So to walk through um, how this might work for some of the uh, simpler use cases, what about if there's multiple images? Well, we can have um, a choice of either a black and white image or a color image. In the Walters case, they have a choice of the image in red with light, the image in blue light, the image in raking light, the image, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is obviously a, an important one for them. We can then have as many text annotations as we want associated at whatever granularity is desired or possible with the appropriate part of the canvas in order to build up the, you know, the layout. So before all of you great UI, UX people uh, jump up and down and say, oh my god, that's hideously ugly. The only thing that is pretty about that is the image and it's not yours. Uh, we agree. <laughs> we completely agree. that uh, This is a proof of concept implementation um, at sharedcanvas.org. Um, it works, it's not pretty. Uh, and so when, we, when Ben said uh, we want the experts to build it, he was looking at you. Uh, so we have uh, here um, the, the text overlaid over top of the text, uh, the image underneath, um, non-rectangular comments. So the, the expanded comment is about the King of England, who's highlighted in blue. And a, the choice of image between color and, and black and white. Equally, in this, this digital world, we can do a lot of facsimiles with digital resources in ways that we couldn't do if all we had was a print book. So for example, uh, this is a book, um, uh, sorry, a leaf from a book, because it's a fly leaf, uh, one of the uh, opening pages before the actual content um, of a book in the Cambridge Library, Cambridge University Library. And it obviously has music as well as text, so wouldn't it be great to have a rendition of the music associated with the part of the canvas which represents the page that has the music in it. We can do that using a different type of annotation, an audio annotation, where the audio is the resource which is then painted onto the canvas. This particular uh, manuscript is also really important from the um, physical distribution and, and loss of pages. So we know from uh, information um, associated with this that there was at least 600 folios in this manuscript, so it would have been this big. However, this is one of the only pages that remains, not through careful preservation, but because it was bound as a protective cover over top of another book. Um, 
So if there are other manuscripts in the world, which also were similarly protected from, uh, with pages from this original manuscript, the only way that we can reconstruct that is digitally. So the distributed paradigm is really the only way to, to go in this case. And again, here's the proof of concept implementation. You click on the, the play button and it plays the uh, associated performance of that music. Uh, working at a national security lab, hi, ACLU person, um, you're probably interested, well, hmm, what do the government spooks really want with all of that data? No, we don't want the data. We're, we're not storing any information about um, medieval manuscripts. We use a publish subscribe method. Um, you push the, the data, uh, your annotation to somewhere using some protocol, uh, and they put it on the web for you. That's the only requirement. So that could be um, uh, blog posts on GData, it could be in uh, Twitter if your annotation was really short. Uh, it could be in Dropbox, it could be anywhere you want. So we don't specify how you push it to the web, we don't specify how other services get it, but it's on the web, and get it they will. And of course we don't specify what they do with it and how other people interact with it. But that's the model that we um, are espousing. So we hope that this will then engender more services for those blue guys um, where they will add value, preservation, um, better linking, et cetera, et cetera. So, as you can guess from the title of my slide, uh, we will have some time for questions. Um, in summary, uh, the Canvas paradigm provides us a coherent solution to modeling the layout of medieval manuscripts, dot, 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 and any other collaboratively created resource. So the comics that we saw so vividly demonstrated earlier with the infinite canvas um, could equally be built up collaboratively using annotations in the same way. Um, newspapers, uh, digitized newspapers, uh, PhD theses that need to be transcribed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, from the implementation side of the, of the data model, um, we think that the distribution across repositories for all resources is <laughs> stupendously important. Um, not only for the physical separation of uh, manuscripts, but also to separate the data, which libraries are very good at preserving and serving, from the user interface, which libraries are very bad at uh, creating. Uh, the publish subscribe method enables customized views, uh, avoids vendor lock-in, provides a marketplace for services, um, and encourages, I'm hitting on this point a lot, you can tell, uh, encourages tool development by experts, not by the people who have the data. So the, the 10 second um, elevator pitch, shared canvas brings digitized works to the desktop in a powerful, extensible, and interoperable fashion. So thank you very much for your attention this late in the afternoon. I guess we have time for two questions. Sure, at the back. Uh, well, sort of. Sort of. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yes, they have been published about. We don't have a formal specification document. Um, so the open annotation specifications are definitely published, um, and we're working with NISO as yesterday to standardize them. Um, this is a thin layer over top of open annotation and the OAI object reuse and exchange um, method of aggregating resources together. You can find the initial documentation at sharedcanvas.org. There's a paper, a white paper that describes it, yep. um, and more will follow. Yep. Um, the best resource at the moment um, is probably the seminar that we gave at the British Library. Um, the slides of which are, are in, the, um, in the site and on SlideShare if you want to search for them. Uh, we would like to. Um, so we've had interest from the Courtauld Institute um, in uh, London. They have a bunch of Gothic ivories, which are sort of triptychs um, that you can fold out um, to see the different, um, different panels. Uh, and they want to use something similar to this uh, in order to increase the interactivity um, so that not, people aren't just looking at, well, here's a photograph of the 
all the panels closed. Here's a photograph of that one open. Here's a photograph of that one open. Um, the issue, of course, is three dimensions. Um, yes, there's WebGL. Um, we are not experts in WebGL. Um, we'd be very interested in working with people who are to try and explore what possibilities there would be um, to do something like this for three-dimensional objects. Um, do we have time for one more? Uh, no. Is there a yes-no question? No. Okay. Thank you very much.